It is the middle of summer, so I thought maybe it was time for a little math refresher. <laughs> promise it won't be too painful. I promise. All right. So in the gospel story we're about to hear, that I'm about to read, we're going to hear about Jesus and he sends his disciples on a mission. He sends them out two by two, all right? So we're gonna do a little, we're gonna talk about um, exponential growth. Anybody, have, has any of you talked about exponents, exponents in your math class yet? Probably not, right? No, I think that's an algebra concept. We're way ahead, I'm way ahead of you. Okay, however, exponential growth means that things grow fast, really, really fast, like faster than just adding one and adding another and adding another. So let me show you an explanation. And in this case, I'm going to use a little genetics. Uh, we're getting a genetics lesson too, actually. But, <clears throat> but here, let's say this is Jesus, okay? So this is a chart that we would use <clears throat> in genetics, except, you know, in genetics, there have to be at least two people, but we're just going to say one. All right, so here's Jesus, and he tells one person about God's love. And let's say that person tells one person about God's love, and that person tells one person about God's love. So this is Jesus. How many people does he tell? Okay, so, so three people learn about Jesus' about Jesus's love, right? <clears throat> but let's say, instead of Jesus just telling one person, let's say Jesus tells two people, okay? And then maybe each of them tell two people. And then each of them tell two people. Earlier, I could see Declan counting with me. I can't draw and count at the same time, otherwise I would do that out loud for you. That's too much multitasking for Pastor Heather. All right, so in this case, all Jesus did was add, was add one person to how many he told. And each of them just added one more person. So in this scenario, here's Jesus, right? How many people learn about Jesus' love? Let's count together. One. Two. Okay, y'all count out loud because I know you can count. One. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Fourteen people. Instead of three. Just, is that backwards? It sure is. Again, this is why I passed through Heather. There we go. Three. So 14 people know about Jesus just because Jesus told one extra person. Now imagine Jesus sent out 12 people. All right, and let's say each of them told, even if each of them only told two people, I'm not going to do that chart because A, I don't have room, and B, we'd spend a lot of time counting. But imagine how many people would hear about Jesus' love if each of them told two people? That's, that's going to be a lot of people, isn't it? That's 36 people? You're probably right, actually. All right, so here's the thing. We're told to go out and share God's love with other people. Yes, Davey. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Oh, I think it's twelve. Except this one kind of looks like Jesus, right? Yeah, I know. I see that. Yep. You're right. You're right. Okay. So what we're called to do is go out and tell about God's love to other people. And just by telling two people, it can spread far and wide. Just imagine if you told 10 people, right? And your friend told 10 people. Question. You know about this. Yep, it's a tournament. Yep, absolutely. You know about this kind of chart. So this is exponential growth. So when we just tell a couple extra people, God's word grows and grows and grows. And that's what we're called to do. And that's what Jesus talks about in the gospel today. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much. 
for telling us that we need to go out and share your love with others. Help us to grow your family exponentially by telling more than just one person. Help us to tell as many people as we can so all may know your love. We pray this in your name. Amen. There are many things that I'd like to point out in today's gospel, and I want to acknowledge all of them, and in doing so, I hope that it helps to tie them together in a way that makes sense, not only understanding their connection with with the reading itself, but also to understand our own ministries as people of faith in the world today. So digging right in, first, It may seem that this reading, this gospel reading, is in fact two separate stories. We hear the story about Jesus in the hometown, and then we hear the story about him sending out the disciples two by two. I'm I'm not convinced, however, that these are separate stories. Two, Jesus' teachings are not accepted in his hometown. Just as we read in Ezekiel, Ezekiel the prophet is sent out to preach to people who will not listen. In fact, One of the words in this part of the gospel story is translated, or can be translated, disengagement. This is the kind of offense that they took at him. Not only are their feelings hurt, or they are in disbelief, but they are in fact disengaging with him. They are writing him off. Their response to him is one of suspense or guardedness. Three. While Jesus is not accepted in his hometown, he doesn't seem to make too big a deal of it. Instead, he merely explains that he's aware of the conundrum that prophets are are with honor most places except their hometown, anywhere but their hometown. And he works to cure the people in his hometown, but it doesn't work well, and he is amazed at their unbelief. Which brings us to point four. If you think back to many of the miracle stories and the stories of healing that we've heard recently over the last few months, and actually many, if not most, of the gospel stories of Jesus healing or the miracles that Jesus does, you'll find Jesus often remarking to the recipients, your faith has made you well, or you of little faith, why did you doubt? Healing And miracles are deeply tied in the gospel to a person's belief in what Christ can do for them. And so thus in Nazareth, when Jesus claims the people's unbelief, he is unable to do very much. So again, point five, without worrying too much about the people in his hometown not being healed, instead, he sends out the twelve to maximize his ministry. If they're not going to listen here, we'll just send them out. He sends them out to maximize his ministry to other towns to heal and to speak. He doesn't dwell on sticking around and trying to convince the people in his hometown or fighting with that hometown crowd. He instead moves out and works on those who may be more willing to accept his gifts and his ministry. Six. We spent this past Lent learning about the baptismal promises that we make as part of God's covenant with us in baptism. And we tied those promises to a paradigm, an understanding of a life of faith, part of a life of faith initiative that we're working on here in our congregation. And it's tied to an understanding of God's community of believers, which is nothing new to the Lutheran church, right? Martin Luther taught us over 500 years ago that we, all of us, are the priesthood of all believers. It means that everyone in this room, because of the priesthood of all believers, means everyone in this room is a priest. Everyone can go out and be a priest in the world. Not just me, not just Pastor Steve. You don't have to be ordained to be a little priest because we are the priesthood of all believers. Just as the disciples were given authority to go out and heal and cast out demons, so are we given authority to go out and share the gospel, heal, and teach, and touch. We are given the authority to take God's love out into the world, to love and serve our neighbors everywhere, every day, and in everything that we do. We are called to be just 
like the disciples Jesus sends out in this reading. Seven, when Jesus sends the disciples out, they're to go out humbly and dependent. Dependent on God for what they need to heal or speak and dependent on the kindness and hospitality of strangers for the things that they need, the earthly things like food and water and a place to sleep. Matt Skinner of Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota writes, Jesus instructs them to model simplicity and dependency in what they wear and carry. They adorn themselves with a confidence that God or strangers will provide what they need. They avoid appearances of seeking personal gain. By staying in a single house in any given place, they make it clear that they aren't trying to game up their way toward greater creature comforts. If no one listens to them, they should sever associations, refusing to take even the town's dust with them on their way out. That detail sounds harsh, but so too is any village's refusal to welcome undersupplied travelers in the first place. I want to add on to that just to say that it was customary and even expected in those times that you welcome the stranger, that you take care of them, that you provide for them. And also in the sense of taking nothing from the people that are not willing to listen, they're to shake even the dust off and leave it behind. Skinner goes on to intimate that the disciples were successful because of three things. One, the source of their authority and power is Jesus. They're still followers when given power. Our power comes from Jesus, not ourselves. Two, when the word of God is spread extensively, it always yields a harvest. So thinking back to a few weeks ago when we heard the parable of the sower of the seeds, Jesus talks to the people and then explains that parable to disciples, I have to believe that that came first because they needed to know that before he sent them out. They needed to understand that their job was to sow the seeds and that some places it wouldn't grow and some places it would, but their job isn't to make it grow. Their job is simply to plant the seeds. Three, the reign of God that Jesus and his ministry begins is corporate or communal in nature. In other words, it's not about making Jesus, I mean, Jesus is the center of it all, but it's not all about Jesus doing it all. It's about all of us spreading the ministry and sharing in a like way. It's shared abroad and abundantly this way by many other than just Jesus that teaches this new way or a renewal of the faith from the older times. We hear in Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah speaks from God saying, I will make a new covenant with the people. They will be my people and I will be their God and they will know me. And also in Matthew's gospel, we're told by Jesus, just before his ascension to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus in this declaration gives all of us the authority to go and do just what he called the disciples to do in Mark. We are a priesthood of all believers called upon to go out into the world to love and serve our neighbor. What we're not called to do, however, according to Mark chapter 6, is to do it with all kinds of pomp and circumstance, and Paul backs that up as well. Paul says we are not to boast of ourselves, we are to boast in Christ. We're not to be better than, we're not to be righteous, we're not to be exclusive, we are not to take with us anything from those who do not want to hear or believe. We are simply called to go and share and baptize. We are called to go humbly. We are called to go dependent on the work that God does through us, God's work, our hands. We are called by God's authority, not our own. We are called to create a large group, a larger group of ministers, not a hierarchy of ministers. We are called to a living faith as ministers in what we do every day everywhere, and with everyone. And we are called away from our home. As much as it is necessary and wonderful for us to gather here, part of our baptismal promise is to live among God's faithful people. So when we gather here at APLC, we experience time for worship and care, and we learn and we serve. 
We are ultimately, however, called by Jesus to leave this place, this home, to go out and serve in the world. When we leave this place every Sunday, we say, we, com we are commanded to go and serve the Lord. Go in peace and serve the Lord. So let's do just that. Amen.